Hi, welcome to Political Perspectives. I'm Cynthia Dickstein, your Political Perspectives host. Our topic today is Big Media Failing Democracy. We have a very special guest with us, author and veteran foreign correspondent Mort Rosenblum. He has reported from 180 countries during the past 40 years. He was former chief international correspondent for the Associated Press and former executive editor of the International Herald Tribune. In the spring of 2006, Mort Rosenblum joined the International Journalism Program at the University of Arizona, where he teaches an undergraduate course on international reporting. Welcome, Mort. It's great to have you with us. Good to be home. Now, you're an old Tucson boy, right? Grew up here. Yep. How old were you when you came? Oh, I was about minus four, I think. <laughs> I, uh, I Actually, I moved here when I was three from Wisconsin, but I don't really count those early years in Milwaukee, so I'm, I, I've been here a long time. Mm -hmm. And you live in Paris now? I live, yeah, I live in Paris and I live in the south of France. I um, kind of go back and forth and then I bounce around covering stories. So I sort of live in an airplane seat mostly. Mm -hmm. When did you know you wanted to be or become an international foreign correspondent? Uh, pretty young. I mean, I kind of always wanted to be a reporter and I think I wanted to be a foreign reporter really early. I mean, when I was going to Peter Howell, I think, in elementary school. but. Mm -hmm. What really happened was I was going to school at Arizona, and I was a sophomore, I think, and my journalism professor dropped a, a letter on my desk um, from some guy who ran a newspaper in Venezuela saying, have you got anybody who speaks Spanish and is stupid enough to work for what I'm not going to pay? And I wrote the guy and got the job, and uh, that was it. I, was, I think I was 17 then. And the rest is history, as they say. Well, <laughs> the rest is past. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most uh, depressing event you ever covered? Well, I've, you know, I've covered a lot of war and squalor and stuff over the years, so a lot of it is, but um, if you don't count Iraq. Um, the um, I think probably the worst thing was in Goma, right after that whole Rwanda episode, because, you know, we essentially squandered the lives of 800,000 Rwandans, and when it was all over, um, refugees came pouring across the border into Goma in the Congo and people were just, I mean, they were quite literally dropping dead as we were watching them. The cholera was all over the place and there wasn't enough food and, you know, they, they couldn't they couldn't bury them because it was on volcanic rock and the aid was late in coming and, I mean, just one reason after the other and it was just, and I, you know, I don't want to ruin anybody's breakfast, but, I mean, just the smell, I, I, that will never, never leave my nostrils. I mean, it just, it, it just it, it, what makes it bad is that, is the thing itself, but also the fact that it's so unnecessary. These things just happen, and we don't stop them from happening, and once they do happen, we don't stop the causes of them getting worse, and then when it's all over, we do the wrong thing. How would you compare coverage back then, in the beginning of your career, to international news coverage today in America? Well, when I went overseas in the 60s, um, you know, back then we talked about, oh, if a story is not in the first top 10, an international story is not in the first top 10 list, um, then nobody pays any attention to it. And then over a period of time, probably during, toward the end of Vietnam, that somehow got whittled down to three. Oh, a story's got to be in the top three or you don't pay much attention to it. Now we're very lucky if there's one. I mean, the other day I was just picking up the Arizona Republic, and it showed, you know, it was on page two was the world briefing. There was a huge map of the United States, you know, and a couple of, like the old Lenny Steinberg cartoon of New York. There was a huge map of the United States and a couple of things there, and, you know, one or two things on Iraq, which is essentially a domestic story now. And um, so I, comparing it over 40 years, um, it's taken quite a, a serious um, turn downward which is kind of scary because now the world is so small that it's it's extremely important that we know what's going on. I mean, some cartoonist in Denmark can draw some silly lines and, you know, call it the prophet, and there'll be riots in the Sudan, people people killed. Um, we have to know these things. We have to be aware of these things. Now, back in 93, um, was it, you wrote a book called Who Stole the News? Mm. Why We Can't Keep Up With Happens in the World and What We Can Do About It. Right. Now, that was much sooner, uh, much earlier than most people became aware of the information overload that we have and the fact that a lot yeah. of that information isn't relevant and we're not getting the importance. Well, you know, that was, uh, uh, Who Stole the News was sort of an update of a book I wrote in, in the 70s called Coups and Earthquakes. And now I'm doing it again. I'm in a different kind of a way. I'm writing a different kind of book now. But essentially, you know, it's like 
it's like that old thing in network, you know, you stick your head out the door and scream, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, and everybody kind of laughs and turns you into a clown. I, I honestly don't really know. I'm, I'm learning some, some things and I'm make, getting some ideas, but how to get Americans more interested in, in what affects their life. It's, 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 inc it's incredible to me to know how so many things are going wrong. Our world is, this is not a joke, this is not some, you know, this, the world is, is in unbelievable shift in, climate, you know, in, in terms of climate, in terms of precipita precipitation, in terms of, of so many things, just physically. Politically, I mean, the, the mess we're making, I mean, the, the mess we have made in Iraq and the overflows and, and, and the continuing, you know, in so many different ways, all of these things have to be understood. Um, we have to elect the right kind of people. We have to watch these people to make them actually do what they say they're going to do. We have to take part in things ourselves. And we don't have um, a basic text from which to know what's going wrong, i.e. newspapers, radio. Well, if, TV. if big media is closing down foreign bureaus, I mean, I just heard this morning that the Boston Globe is closing the last of its three foreign bureaus, and, and they're, mm -hmm. you know, part of a long line of people who have done that for yeah. budgetary consideration. And, right. and, you know, if the world's getting smaller, but also our news and our information about the world is getting so much smaller, how is the average citizen supposed to cope and be a good citizen and vote properly yeah. and it, it's you know the the trouble the trouble with i mean we say the media which is about as you know i mean that's like a, a six letter collective now and that's about as much useless useful as stuff you know the media the press but mm -hmm. i mean i be an old newspaper person i still prefer the press for the general thing but 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 you're right the, the our collective media um, are not doing the job. Some of them are better than others, and we can't dismiss them because they're really what, what we've got. So we have to start, here's what we've got to do. We've got to play to the strengths of what we do have. We have the New York Times, which when it's good, it's very good. When it's not good, which is also happens, you know, it can choose to, to decide to wait 14 months to tell us that the president is, is tearing up the Constitution. Um, so it's only one, but it's, it's there. It's a solid newspaper. We have NPR, um, which once again it's, has its drawbacks and, and, and whatnot. But in today's world, we can also listen to BBC, which is what foreign correspondents have done forever. Um, you listen for five minutes at the top of the hour, BBC radio, and you have an agenda. You, at least you know what the main lines are. And with the net, I mean, with, with different websites and, and with different ways of, you know, not only, you know, it's one thing to have citizen journalists, you know, that sit there and, you know, it's, I always kind of think of citizen orthopedic surgeons, you know, I wouldn't want some clown I've never met who's sitting at his mother's, you know, kitchen table in North Dakota working on my ankle, you know what I mean? So, so I'd rather have a real journalist. But you've got these consolidators like, like Truth Out and Common Dreams and, and things like that that, that, that that go to, you know, that find good stuff. And not necessarily the United States. I mean, the British papers are extremely good. Um, German papers are good. Um, the Danish papers are good. And now, because of the net, you can get them translated. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm saying is you have to work at it now. I mean, people say, oh, you've got to spend 20, 30 minutes a day, you know, four or five days a week doing aerobic exercises. That's true. But you really should spend the same amount of time and maybe at the same time, you know, getting your mind aerobic. You don't have to follow every, you don't have to follow every thing that's going on. But if you have things like like Darfur, for example, which, you know, I mean, there's no excuse not to know what's going on in Darfur. The American Congress declared Darfur a genocide in 2004. We've got Nick Kristof writing his heart out every day about Darfur. We have people going there. We have Ann Curry from NBC going and doing a really good job. I mean, it's there, and yet we ignore it. And so what happens? So people like Saddam, people like, like you know, like, you know, like like Hezbollah, they, they 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 see us and they say, well, we don't really care. We talk the talk, and you know, we you know we get up there and we make noises. But the minute it's difficult, or the minute it takes kind of following, oh, the Americans don't care. They don't know who gives a damn. They're all silly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, these guys are right. Do you think Americans don't care because they're not really being presented with the information in a way? I mean, it, television is still the way most people, mm -hmm. the average yeah. American, gets its news, and. Uh, 
you know, and, and again, you're right. We shouldn't yeah. compare. We shouldn't put all journalism in, uh, under media. No, you definitely can't. Because yeah. there's a big difference between print journalism yeah. and television. But, but, and but even so, I mean, no collective noun. I mean, the thing is, is some is good and some isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we had, for example, look at CNN, for example, is a good example. Over in in France, they had these marching in the streets over. You know, won't bore you with all the details, but essentially, it was a, a, a government program to take away some of the, the the protections for employers for young students just starting out and and the french being pretty smart could see how that was going that's globalization that's going to take away things that are really part of the basis of the french society they got on the streets well the organizers had it very much under control the police had it very much under control i mean there are a bunch of people in the streets and so it was a little bit raucous but and one of the correspondents for cnn chris burns who really knows the situation well knows french was explaining what was going on some anchor person in Atlanta says, gee, it kind of reminds you of the marchers at Tiananmen Square in 1989. You know, this is, you know, and Chris had to apologize. Um, so CNN can get it right, CNN can get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, what I'm saying to you, I think, is, is that we can't really blame the media. The media is really letting us down. The media is really falling apart. The reasons are, as we all say, I mean, they're, they're run now almost all by business people. They're run by bottom line stock prices. There's a lot of reasons why. And yes, correspondents are coming home. And yes, um, a lot of it is weaker than it's ever been. Um, some of it's stronger. But the main thing is it's up to us as citizens. It's up to us. I mean, we're fathers, we're mothers. Uh, it's up to us to know what's going to make our kids sick or not. You know, you can't blame the school nurse. You know what I mean? So we, we have to, we ourselves have got to learn how to find out what's going on in the world and also find out what the shape of the world is to be able to put events into context. But what about the fact that the, the argument that the media makes that they're giving the public what they want, that the sex and the sensationalism um, and the celebrity is really what Americans are after? Well, that certainly applies to a lot of the media and that's the kind of thing that just, I mean, I, it makes me crazy. It makes me crazy. I mean, I, I watch my friends quite literally get killed um, to be able to get reality across. And, you know, here, the, uh, somebody ran some, uh, some survey, and I think the most, the news story that got the greatest hit last year or the year before was some man having sex with his horse in Colorado or something like that. I mean, just, just really outrageous things. I mean, Oprah, Oprah goes to Paris and Hermes isn't going to open late for her. They have no idea who she is, and that's like a major story. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's insane. To me, it's, 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 it's an outrage. But, you know, people, it's a, they, these are businesses. You know, these things are all businesses. And therefore, um, BBC's not, NPR's not. Um, um, this isn't. Um, but, um, but you're going to get that. And so, you know, in an adult society, which, you know, out of 300 million of us, enough of us ought, ought to be, um, <laughs> We just have to be able to put aside, you know, what's media and what's not media. I mean, you know, Geraldo Rivera is going to be Geraldo Rivera, um, but you're also going to get. I mean, you can say, okay, you can. Ted Koppel can get moved out of his out of out of a very important time slot and, and, and program because somebody has decided somebody else wants. But then he'll surface somewhere else and do something else. So I guess once again, what I'm saying is, it's up to us mm -hmm. to um, to find out what works and what works mm -hmm. for us. Even uh, somebody like Keith, Keith Olbermann, who mm. was one of the first to really come out uh, and speak truth to power right. in terms of the media. I mean, you know, the first half or first 40 minutes of his show is serious news, and then it's almost as if then the next 20 minutes is all foolishness. Yeah. And it's almost as if he or the producers feel that they have to throw that in to, right. to hook people yeah. so that at least they can give them the interesting stuff. Yeah. You know, it, that's that's unfortunately how it works. And I mean, it was a, it was really interesting to me because I was when I've I've been working on this book, uh, uh, this this book I'm working now about uh, the subtitle of it is American Blindness to a World in Peril, and I'm sitting in my little olive trees in the south of France, and I'm reading the net, and I see, and I'm seeing this. Who is this Keith Olderman guy? I mean, this guy's this guy's this guy's really speaking truth. Who is this voice? Mm -hmm. You know, and then I kind of track him down and figure out the MSNBC business and stuff, and and that's what it is. It's all. It's all a bunch of marketers trying to figure out what works what and what works. doesn't work. Um, we're not going to change that. I mean, you know, we're not. You know, the 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 way the corporate thing. It's 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 again horrible. I think if you want my advice, my opinion of it, I think it's I think it's really lousy. <laughs> uh, 
I think it's, if you want my opinion of it, I think it's really lousy. But um, <coughs> but it's part of, of a reality. It's the same kind of reality that's putting up houses on all these ridges and mm-hmm. putting 400 housing units on that beautiful piece of property between, you know, between Anklem and Speedway. What are you going to do? So you find ways around it. Well, let's give people uh, some information of where they can become well informed. Mm-hmm. There are two websites that we're going to recommend. Uh, Foreign Policy in Focus, which is www.fpif.org, and CommonDreams.org News Center, uh, www.commondreams.org, and both of those um, will certainly keep a reader informed. And then we have two books to recommend as well. The first is No Questions Asked, News Coverage Since 9-11 by Lisa Finnegan, and The second is The Death of the Media and the Fight to Save Democracy by Danny Schechter. And that leads me into my next question for you. How much trouble is democracy in because of the consolidation of the media and the commercialization of the media, Um, big media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, democracy is in very, very big trouble, Uh, particularly American democracy. I mean, it's, it's, I had, I had a woman in class the other day and I'm, I'm, you know, we were, she was talking about how wonderful it was to live in America, and I'm saying, well, what's the most democratic country? And you know, and she, hand shoots up. And America. people don't realize how much we've given up. People don't realize how much our tyranny of the majority over a thin plurality is. I mean, it's just they're just they're, they're, we we've given up so many things, and we've we, and we've cut the edges on so many things, and we've given so much authority um, to essentially people we hire to keep order um, that we just don't realize it and people have to somebody has to be keep this you know keep this in a front agenda and let people know and the media is not doing that um, so we've lost a lot yes um, you mentioned earlier uh, other uh, countries the press in other countries mm-hmm. I mean where would you hypothetically where would you rank the US press in terms of quality of international coverage Compared to England, France, Italy, you know the, the places you mentioned earlier. Well, if I were to take out the New York Times, I'd put us way down there, way down there. Mm-hmm. Um, the coverage, without the, uh, it, this is not to say the Washington Post isn't good, or the LA Times doesn't have some good people, the Wall Street Journal, but by and large, for a really good look at what's going on in the world and the causes of it and the reality of it, I'd say the British papers are better. I'd say the German papers are better. I'd say sometimes the Italian papers are better. I'd say because they devote space to it and they care about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we 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 just don't do it. So if we don't do something to wrest the control of of the media away from corporations, um, can democracy survive? Um, good question. I don't think Thomas Jefferson would think it would. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I'm, I'm, I have to tell you. I really have to tell you something. I am very worried about American democracy. Mm-hmm. I'm extremely worried because I, I'll tell you why. I've, you know, I danced on Red Square the night that communism died. I mean, I've covered all of these guys. I've covered dictatorships. I've been, I've been jailed by these guys. I mean, I know what a dictator is. I know what a tyranny is, and I'm seeing parallels that just, just raise the hair on the back of my neck. I mean, you know, we talk about Nazi Germany. It doesn't mean that you've got to shovel a whole bunch of people in the ovens to be a Nazi. You know, I mean, the fact to say, and, you know, I mean, just look at, just rent the Dixie Chicks movie if nobody, if you haven't seen it. I mean, here's some woman expressing her opinion as it states clearly in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution, our tradition, really saying, you know, what'd she say? I'm ashamed the president comes from Texas. Texas. I mean, you know, duh. Uh, you know, and people are giving her their death threats. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a wall of, of, of conspiracy that keeps their records off the charts. I mean, it almost ruined these, these women's lives. Mm-hmm. You know, had they didn't have, had, had, didn't have the real, real spirit and stuff. I mean, I, this is, what, what do we boast about? What do we brag about if this is the kind of thing that happens? Do you think that most Americans truly understand the importance of free speech. I mean, everybody, they, they hang on every word when the president talks about mm. freedom. We're bringing right. freedom to Iraq, and right. freedom is our, they hate us because of our freedoms. Yeah. Do you think they really understand I, no, I don't. what free speech means to freedom? I, I don't think so at all. I really don't. I think that, that, that um, in a word, no. Now, isn't the media partially to blame for that lack of understanding? Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, once again, 
what's partially to blame is when we start talking about the media. I mean, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, I sit here and I'm okay. I'm I'm the media. Well, you know, okay. So is Bill O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. You know, so is you know, Ann Coulter. I mean, you know, you can put Ann Coulter in a burqa and 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 um, and people would still oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, you know, there's different. I mean, there was a, there was an interesting poll. I think it was last year, the year before, about. How many, you know, asking people to name who they thought were reporters, and more people thought Bill O'Reilly was a, a journalist than they thought Bob Woodward was a journalist. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you'll get some arguments at the mm -hmm. Post, but that's, you know. Mm -hmm. No, but the serious point of that is a serious point. I mean, we don't really pay attention. And, what, and what's more, sorry, what's mm -hmm. more is we don't realize how important it is that we do pay attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole business about, we call it global warming. Well, you know, we just had the North Pole here the other day. It isn't global warming. It's it's temperature fluctuation and and sea change, and and weather change and and, and agricultural change. Um, you know, what's really going to happen is we're not going to be able to feed ourselves. Every year, China and India are now importing more food. You know, the 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 things are going up. You know, we we've made some really great advances in agriculture that we can bring, but we're going to hit a tipping point. I mean, we're talking about the potential death of billions here. We're talking about seas rising by, you know, by possibly 80 feet. This is not a joke. This is not some person making this up. I mean, these are this is this is real, and therefore we have to start doing the right thing about it. We can't reverse it, but we can certainly make a change. But this is a this is a good example. I was going to use a different example, but of of the fact that um, Americans ranked next to last in the, in a study of 34 nations who believe that evolution is fact and yeah, and yeah, we yeah. don't but this is another example of yeah. the of of the and and I'm sorry I keep saying the media for a shorthand here but of um the news giving equal time to opinion versus fact mm -hmm. and therefore legitimizing an opinion and I can't tell you how many people see it as a legitimate debate about climate change and global yeah, warming yeah. and an awful lot of that if you if you follow the money a lot of the people on the other side are the big corporations who have the most, as you know, mm. the most to gain right. from postponing dealing right, right, with, right, with right. this. And I even noticed, you know, that the government re doesn't even call it global warming anymore. They're now calling it climate change, as if it's out of our hands. Yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. willing to give it a little bit of attention. Mm -hmm. But um, but they're not putting the resources there. I mean, I mean, they, I forgot the number, but I think it's something, if I'm not wrong, the entire budget and, and I'm I may be wrong but it's I'm, I'm in the right ballpark here the entire budget for various forms of science for finding alternative stuff and encouraging different ways and and, and, fi and, and actual technical and scientific ways to meet this challenge comes to about a you know a week and a half of expenditure in Iraq sure. I mean you can start playing with that number and you know and, and uh, mm -hmm. we're just we're just not uh, tackling it mm -hmm. and I mean it's, it's fine to recycle your garbage it's fine you know, but you know, we have these hybrid cars now, and I mean, you see this all the time. It's hysterical. Some guy gets in his Prius in Burbank, and you know, drives to Burbank Airport, and gets in his jet stream, and burns up, you know, as much fuel as eight thousand Humvees, you know, mm -hmm. burn just going off to play golf in 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 the Montana. I mean, it's mm -hmm. insanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Speaking of the, the run up, the run up to the war, mm. and I won't say the media. I'll say specifically the White House press corps mm. and Fox News. Right. You can say the Aren't media. <laughs> it was pretty much the media. If you're it talking was, about that period, it was pretty it much was the pr media in general. Okay, but I mean, aren't they? Shouldn't they be sharing responsibility with Bush and with Congress for the disaster Absolutely. that is Iraq? Absolutely. I mean, I, do you remember that footage when everybody went wild and, 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 and the looters went wild in Baghdad? And that stuff's running back and forth, mm -hmm. and and Rumsfeld is making these really, really disgusting comments about oh, about how what a big happens. funny joke it is, mm -hmm. and about how it's not really very serious. I mean, but what really what what's so frightening about that, and I mean, I was there myself. Um, is any of us correspondents that had the slightest bit of, of 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 experience in the Middle East? I mean, I mean, virtually everyone. I can't think of an exception. Um, knew what was going to happen. We saw what was going to happen. You know, most people thought it was probably probably not such a bad idea to go in and, and clean Saddam's clocks. I mean, Saddam was a bad man. Saddam probably should, you know, if there was a, a good excuse or a good way to get Saddam out of Iraq and give the Iraqis something, allow, allow the Iraqis a chance to get something better, 
you know, why not? That was a political decision or a political issue, not, not for a reporter to make. But for the United States to go in under its own flag, push Humpty Dumpty off the wall without a dustpan, I mean, you know, we bought it. I mean, we broke it, we bought it. Mm-hmm. And everybody, everybody, every, I, and I talked to Arab moderates that I've known for 30 years, people who hated Saddam, people that really thought the United States might make a change. Saying, look, you go in, you push the United, you, you get out ahead of the United Nations, and you you force a few people to come along with you. I mean, coalition of the willing, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Blair's out of office, and Tony Blair lost his job, Osnar lost his job in Spain. You know, I mean, it's just it's for coming for going along with us. Mm-hmm. It's the um, I think that most of Americans. I mean, nine eleven sent everybody into a, a collective coma, pretty mm-hmm. much, mm-hmm. and um, the media in the media included. And all the administration had to do was say, you're not patriotic. And and they were cowed. And it it didn't seem to me that they showed much courage then. Very little courage. And the thing is, is is Cheney, we know now, and a lot of people knew then, um, already had Iraq in his sights. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, know, 9-11 was simply a a, a very, very good excuse. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, it was a wonderful flag to wave. I mean, it was, but at the beginning, I mean, I was in France at the time, um, and I, I was in the AP Bureau at the time, and I, you know, and somebody said, hey, look at this, and we were actually watching it on television. We, wa- we saw the first, we saw the first plane hit, and we're watching, and all this stuff's going on, and you know, it might have been an accident, we didn't really know, and then we saw the second plane hit, and then we saw the thing come down, and I'm telling you, everybody, including you know, the editors of Le Monde, which is a pretty snippy left-wing paper that doesn't really, isn't usually really wild about the United States. The editor said, you know, we are all Americans. I mean, we had, we the Americans, had probably 98% backing around the world. I mean, there are some people, mm-hmm. you know, in Palestinian camps jumping up and down, but we squandered that almost immediately. We have one minute left, and I wanted to talk uh, for half of that time about your book that's coming out in the fall, mm. if you can just tell us. Yeah, the sub- as I say, the subtitle is America's Blindness to World in Peril. It's, it's, it's a lot about the media. It's a lot about, you know, what's going on in the you know, world physically. It's a lot about the mistakes, things that we need to do so that our children and our grandchildren have a world. Mm-hmm. We need to do and need to be aware of. And that will be published in. Should be out in. Uh, it'll be out in September, inshallah, in um, mm. St. Martin's Press. Very good, very good. And just so we don't leave on a depressing note, <laughs> uh, your last book was on chocolate. Was on chocolate. There's wonderful chocolate. The good news is, in spite of all this, chocolate is getting better than ever, and it's not all that hard to find, even in America. Great. It's nice to close on an up note. <laughs> Mort Rosenblum, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's been a pleasure, and uh, as I suspected, the half hour went by much too quickly. Thanks very much. I'd like to leave everyone with um, the words of one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, third U.S. president, architect, and author, who said, information is the currency of democracy. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, and thank you. What a pleasure. We went by fast.